Um, let's quickly review. Um, who's here? Look at the top of the page. Who, who's here? Okay. Those are the two people that he actually will talk to, but who are they? What is their sin? Heretics. What are heretics? Uh, people who teach false doctrine. Yes. And they just stand by that. All right. good, good way to put it. That's a good, succinct definition. They teach false doctrine. They teach lies about theology, about God. Um, <clears throat> What is their punishment? Well, I'll tell you, uh, we got to see more on the next page. They are, they are entombed in burning caskets or tombs. So heat up a casket red hot, and that's where the heretics are. Um, this is a little harder to, to maybe see. Can any of you have any idea if you're a teacher of false doctrine? Why would this be an appropriate punishment? I think it's a stretch a little bit, but I'll be impressed if you come up with it. You have any idea why? Yeah. Yeah, I mean you're you're right on track. Um, I think the the reason it's it's iron, isn't that what they call it? <clears throat> iron or they were immovable. They were unchangeable in their lives. And so they have to live now within that. The, the coffin <coughs> represents the, how, how stubborn they were about it. They wouldn't listen to the truth. They continued to teach the lie. And of course, the burning makes sense because that's part of the punishment. Uh, <coughs> uh, heretics, let's see if there's anything else. Virgil's advice. All right, so the first one he meant, he sees is uh, Farinata. So he speaks to this guy named Farinata and said, we'll go to the top of the page. We'll go to Daniel. This summon during the end of the Shalom, summon the seven and come and stand that in my dread I shrank up close against my Apostle. Come, come, what art thou doing? Turn around, he said. That's Farinata. Look. on his, then then he paused. Upright, he had lifted him. Right. He, he sat upright in the coffin. Strong <clears throat> journey from this king that hold all hell in deep dark and fright. In my dead guy with ready hands undaunted resting before his hand through the tomb of hate. Dead in my youth I said in my speech So Farinata actually speaks to him first. Um, I want to read one more and then we'll go to Lydia. <clears throat>
words he used to get over his road, the torment was sufficient for the joy. His name is thus my point of answer shown. He left upright crying. What, what dost thou say? He felt my thoughts. Our life he feeling the oar? Was he no longer on the pleasant day? Then seeing me hesitate a while before I made my reply, he let himself suffer and fall backward again to show he faced no more. But that great hearted spirit, at his call, I stayed my step. His countenance did not move, nor bend his neck, nor stir his eyes off. And if he spoke straight on to where he, we broke off, if they missed church of it, I burn less to have said than was the thought of their love. But thou, ere fixed time, the light return, to that keen face who reigneth here below, shall, shall find out just when the trip crossed the line. But then, but tell me why, as thou dost hope to go back to the light, thy people make this grief decrees so harsh and so house and made it so. That field of havoc and bloody butcher, butcheries, I answer them, Fill their tem temple with useless blasphemy. He sighed before he spoke and shook his head. Faith, I was not alone there, nor had God in with the rest of us without good cause to say. But when they made agreement, every one to wipe out Florence, and I stood and played boldly for her, I, there I was alone. Now so may rest come sometimes to your feet, said I. Pray solve me this perplexity, which tied my brain in this tight knot of need. If things you can force me into prophecy, events that time will bring. If I care right, the living presence can be healed of this. All right, uh, let's let's review here. <clears throat> Look at question um, 44. You've answered that. These are the heretics. They're burning in coffins and tombs, red hot. Um, and then it says, 45, Cavalcanti's sadness when he believes that Dante is hiding his son's death from him suggests an important element in the, in the condemned soul's ability. They cannot see the present. Farinata confirms this in line 103, 105 um, of Canto 10. Why do you believe this is so? Well, um, we, do, we have to read 103 to 105, but just note that there are two people, Cavalcante and Farinata, that speak, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes? Um, what's 41? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, well, it's on page 123. I'm going to have to look back and see the exact reference, but it says on 123, um, I was not long stripped of my mortal shell when she compelled me to pass within you um, wall to fetch a spirit from Judas's circle of hell. And so, what's the question? Um, this was, and it says, this is the deepest, darkest place of all. So, it's Judas. Judas is one of the three people that we know, well, you'll find out more. We are going to read the last um, canto, even though we're not going to read everything up to that point. Does that answer the question? Judas. All right, let's go back to 45. Um, we can't answer all that yet, but Cavalcante overhears Dante talking to Farinata and says, where's my son? And Dante happened to say these words. He said, um, um, he that waits yonder leads me on this road for whom perhaps your Guido felt disdain. He uses the word felt, like in the past tense. Cavalcante says felt. He says felt a life and feeling over, and he thinks that means that his son is dead. He is not. He'll explain that in a minute. But uh, let's just keep reading because we can answer the rest of that now. So uh, Lily at the top of the page. The question is, why is it that you people down here, you can predict the future, but when the future comes to the present, um, you don't know what's going on. In fact, you don't know what's happening now. Like Cavalcante, it should be able to predict whether his son died or not. And yet he doesn't know if his son died or not. And so that's kind of odd. You can you can tell who's gonna win the World Series right here in, in May, and yet when the time comes for the World Series, you have no clue who's gonna win. So would you read?
So, forgive me, I, I was wrong at the beginning. I'm trying to get my bearings. They are inside the city of death. Uh, the angel did come. I'm just reminded of that. Um, the angel did come and open the door. He uh, had a wand with him. He touched the door, and the door opened, and he chastised the demon. He said, why do you do this? You can't win. Uh, and so they are inside, because circle six, the, the circle of heresy, is inside the city. All right, so forgive me for confusing things. Let's go back to 45. Um, what is the reason, well, what is the reason why they never know the future? I mean, they never know the present. Yes. It's like time is punishment because, um, yeah, so when the hour comes, it's the future. They already predicted it, but they don't know it anymore. Right. Daniel? I was just going to say, they can like see it from far off, like when it comes to Good. That's a good point. They, they have um, spiritual Alzheimer's, literally the death of knowledge. You don't know people's names. You don't know where you are. That's a, that's a you know, earthly Alzheimer's. Um, but these people, that's, that's part of their spiritual punishment is the death of knowledge. Uh, can you imagine that? Can you imagine just losing your knowledge of everything? You don't, you don't know anything. Um, you know, we're in the business of learning. That's why we're here. That's the purpose of education is to, to teach and learn. And so as punishment, it, it would be awful to lose all that, which is what's happening. Uh, who is Farinata? What is his relationship to Dante? What aspect of Dante's future does he predict? <clears throat> I Farinata was a Ghibelline. Um, so, you know, the, the two parties, the um, Gilts and Ghibelines. And he fought against the, um, the Gilts, and he fought against Florence. All right, so just, just remember him as an enemy of Florence. And... Uh, he, he says that, however, to defend himself, he said, my colleagues wanted to destroy Florence, but I argued against it. So he's claiming he helped save Florence from total destruction by the other members of his party. What, is, what does he predict about Dante? Um, oh, yeah. Well. <laughs> I'm looking for it. Where does it say that?
Well, that, that that's right. I just I don't see it either. But we'll just go with that. Remember, the book was. Uh, when is the action in the book taking place? Oh, the Oh, sorry. Before the time. Before the time in 1300. Remember my receipt, which right now I can't find. 13. Just remember my receipt, 1300. That's the that's when the action is taking place. But when was he exiled? 1301. And he, he lived till 1321. And that'll help you remember his uh, his timeline. <laughs> and so he writes the book while in exile, but it takes place before exile. So he has one of the characters predict exile. See how that works? All right, so we're skip. We're moving. I'm skipping. We're moving to Canto 11. They are now at a cliff, and this is where they pause again. They've had the pause in front of the city. They walked through the sixth circle. Now they're at a cliff, and they're going to stop a minute here. Yes. Yes. Can we read the story? You can read that too. Uh, Basically, what happens in this chapter is they wait. They're waiting just to kind of get used to the fumes, the smell of hell. And Dante, this is an important chapter because Virgil explains to Dante how hell is put together. So keep reading. you that there are popes in hell because there are a lot of people who claim to be believers that aren't um, nothing is hidden from God we, we don't know the difference I have no idea if you're saved or not if you tell me you are you are. If I tell you I am you should, I hope you believe me um, and we can know the assurance in our own heart that we're saved that, I'll leave it at that if someone says they're saved that's, a, that's between him and God or her and God to determine otherwise um, you want to keep reading? And, and I, I get to. But let's not lose the time so spent. Think now <clears> of <throat> the contemplation of thou canst not. Surely he answered, such was my intent. See now, my son, three narrowing circles one in each place. Thus he took up the seven. Deep under each, like those we've left behind. Damn spirits fill them all. So uh, I would say, why don't you, um, uh, somewhere on the back of this, right now what I'm going to write down, there's not a lot of room in it. So there's three circles left, which we can't read all that. So you remember what circle seven is? Is that the fire one with like the lake? Well, it's violence. Yeah, is it like where they, like there's some people that submerge underneath the uh, Right. That's circle five. Right. Circle six is the heretics, and then circle seven. So circle eight is simple fraud. So 
if that's what's left, then hell, did you get that? Um, then? Hey, wh why is um, why is violence not as bad? We're, we're, the, the assumption is not the assumption. The premise is that the deeper you go in hell, the worse the sins. You know, so there's a hierarchy of sins. They're all in hell, but the closer you get to Satan at the bottom, uh, you know, that means those are the worst sins of all. So it, it says um, uh, a malicious wrong that earns heaven's hate, the end is injury. All such ends are won either by force or fraud. Both perpetrate evil to others, but since man alone is capable of fraud, God hates that worst. The fraudulent lie lowest, then and groan. Of these circles, all the first hold violent men but as the threefold may be their victims in three rings, they are dispersed. All right, so why is violence not as bad as fraud? Uh, either one of you. Uh, well, sorry, Lily. Um, I think that violence is not as bad as fraud. Yeah. Um, it's just because the way violence is That's the way he puts it. That violence, you know, like you get in a fight with somebody and you kill them. That's fine, but it's you're not tricking anybody. Only man is capable of tricking or of fraud. And so why that's the worst. We're also going to divide um, violence into three rings. All right, so violence, the first is going to be in three rings. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to put three rings on. Tell us. All right, so let's take a look. Why don't we read that? Um, Olani, would you read that part? We'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, God's self-innate. God's self-innate against these Chattels? Yeah. Uh, Why don't we pause there? Ring one. We'll flip what you said. The order, first order says God's self and neighbor. It's actually, you flip that order so it's neighbor, self, and God is, is the order. Um, and, and that we'll read all three of those. We, we understand what violence to neighbor is, but violence to self can be in uh, <clears throat> in two things. We're going to see the suicides. Now, you're going to have to know this. I hope you write it down. You actually, if you look, if you look at this page in your questions, all right, take a look at that. <clears throat> gets wonderfully complicated. All right, so uh, others, neighbors, self, and God. Uh, in this area, you have the parents, and it's a river of blood. So that's the punishment. They are being punished by being boiled alive in the river of blood. In this one, there are suicides. And prof legates. Uh, 
suicide is self-explanatory, but profligates are people that gamble and hurt their own property. Why is gambling a sin? Yeah. You know that gamblers lose more than they gain. Uh, I mean, if that weren't true, then the gambling places would go out of business, right? The casinos would go out of business. If they're not making most of the money, uh, most I've never I've never been to one of those places. I don't know that I don't know guys. I think gamble in sports now. I mean, it become legal. It shows you where we're headed. Uh, the lottery is gambling. Um, every time we go to a particular store, and somebody buy a lottery ticket. Uh, but anyway, why is that a sin? Because it's it's wasting resources. And also vandalism. Some people, you know, if you vandalize something, it's wasting. We'll talk about that later. And then God, there are three of them. Uh, blasphemy. Um, sodomy. And usury. sacred things is unsacred. Sodomy is sin of homosexuality. And usury is what? We talked about that. What's usury? What's usury? All right, write it down. Usury is uh, demanding or requiring excessive interest on, on money loans. Um, I didn't put this up here. The suicides are the, are the wood of suicide. And all of these are the, 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 the burning sand, the sand of abomination, the abominable sand. Oh, what did you say about usury? Usury is um, uh, demanding excessive interest or charging excess, excessive interest. So all this is in violence and then fraud We'll find out more about that as we get to it. So we'll come back to that. So uh, why don't we go to Luke where it says, uh, uh, those men do violence. We'll, we'll start there. I think she read that. Oh, those men that do violence to God and curse and their harsh at the last two circles. Sean, why don't you get a pencil out? I feel a lot better when you're busy. Yeah, put it in your hand. Use it. All right. Simple fraud is tricking people in general. That's what fraud is. It's deceiving or tricking people. All right. Let me give you an example. Well, let me explain complex fraud. Complex fraud is tricking people you know. People you have a close relationship with. So, Simple fraud is tricking 
people in general. Complex fraud is tricking people that you know. All right, here's an example. Pickpocket, you're in a, you're in a airport, some, and you, you know, somebody takes your your back, you know, your uh, wallet or something. Or probably more accurate today, online, they don't know you. They just find you're an easy target, and they get your identity, or they hack your account, whatever. That's simple fraud because they don't know you. They're not trying to hurt you. They could care less about you, obviously. They're taking stuff that belongs to you, but they don't know you. Complex fraud, they know you. And there are four different, and we'll get to this later, I won't do it now, but there are four types of relationships that, that you can have. One is to, well, we'll get to that. All right, but you see the difference? Simple fraud, they don't know you. You're, it's an impersonal thing. Complex fraud, they know you. We'll turn the page further. We'll get to you. Pause just a minute. Remember the three animals on the hill? They represented three kinds of sins. Sins of the leopard was incontinence. The sins of the lion were what? Violence. That's the seventh circle. And the friends of the wolf were which is the eighth and ninth circle. So he's, his argument here is that the sins of uh, incontinence offends God less than the other two and is less blameworthy. And the reason that is, is basically, I, I, you know, you might want to do right, but you can't help it. You just, you just give in to it. That's not as bad as, I want to hurt you. And sometimes, of course, everything hurts other people, even incontinence, but that's his argument. All right, you can keep reading. So let's go back to the questions. I think we can get those. Um, 
uh, let's see, uh, 47, discuss how triads are present in Virgil explanation of the remainder of hell, so 134, 135. Um, he mentions, well look, you got it right there on the board. The ring of violence, the three rings of violence, that's a triad. So he, he generally does break down into things down into three. That's a triad. We'll leave it at that. Um, uh, why do you think God's hammer blow of doom smites those guilty of the sins of incontinence with less weight? Well, we just talked about it. Why is incontinence less terrible to God, uh, Sarah? Um, because those people have incontinence. They don't actually like have desire to hurt someone. Right. But so it's not bad to have the desire to hurt people. Right. They're not trying to hurt people, although we know that even those things do hurt people. That was not their intent. So. All these people are in hell, don't forget, but according to perfect punishment, they deserve less punishment or different punishment. Uh, number 49, what is Virgil's answer to Dante's question of why usury is a crime against God's bounty? Well, we just read this. All right, so uh, let me explain it this way. Uh, the uh, it's a crime because money cannot reproduce, right? You, you put a dollar bill down, you, you, it won't reproduce itself. It's not alive. And yet, what happens when you charge somebody interest? I give you five bucks. Well, I give you ten bucks. You owe me eleven. Uh, that's a 10% interest, or you owe me 20, uh, you owe me $2. I, I loan you uh, 10 bucks, and I make you pay me 12 bucks. What if, what is the money just done? It's multiplied itself. And that's unnatural. Um, we weren't supposed to make money by money. Money doesn't, again, reproduce itself. We were supposed to make money on two things, make a living art, which is labor, and natural resources. So man was meant to earn money by labor and the land, not money. So we can come back to that, but we're actually on page 50. I'll give you a review sheet, and uh, we will keep reading. We are, if we can do two of these in the next couple of days, by Wednesday, we might be, uh, we might be finished reading can focus on review. We will see you tomorrow after the quiz. We'll take a quiz and then we'll talk.